In just a few moments, we're going to turn our attention to God's Word in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are going to look at the theological applications of the resurrection as well as the life applications of the resurrection. We have the truth of it, and then how does that impact the way that we live our lives? Before we do that, however, I want to talk just a moment about Easter. This has been, I guess, one of the strangest Easter's in my entire life. There's never been, we haven't had our egg hunts. We haven't been able to gather together. We haven't, we haven't been able to go and see the, the different homes and the way people put eggs in their yards. And I think that, that this Easter has coming and going with not much fanfare. We aren't able to do the Easter musical that the choirs worked so hard to try to accomplish. We've had to put that on hold. And as I stand here preaching to an empty room, I don't get to see all the bright and smiling faces or the people who are, who are dressed in their Easter wear, the things that they've bought, the bright outfits or the, the, the loud hats or things like that. And I think that Easter, if we aren't careful, we're going to lose the joy that Easter is supposed to bring. And actually, I think that oftentimes Easter sneaks up on us. Even when we're able to fellowship together and to gather together in our churches and drive around and go buy our Easter outfits, oftentimes Easter becomes little more than a time to give children candy and have a slightly more uh, excited service in our churches. I think that a large part of our existence as Christians, at least in America, at least, at least in, in my circles, there's been a, a loss of excitement when it comes to talking about Christ's resurrection and our resurrection. And so what I hope to do today, as I look at the theological implications of the resurrection as well as the life applications of the resurrection, what I really hope today is that as we marry those two together, that it will re-inspire the joy that we're supposed to have because of this. And maybe it's because each and every Sunday we in some way, shape, and form are celebrating the resurrection. I mean, that's why, that's why Christians change the day of worship from the Sabbath Saturday to Sunday, because Christ came back to life on Sunday. And, and maybe, maybe it, gets, it gets less excited because it's tucked away in every week and wears something like Christmas. That's something we celebrate one time a year. I don't know why, but I think that on a day like today, when we are celebrating the historical event, that we need to look at it with absolute joy and wonder and excitement because of what it means for us. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to begin by reading in chapter 15 and follow along, and I'm just going to try to take it uh, slowly and look at some of the aspects of this. I'm not going to take a lot of your time this morning. I know you're sitting at home. I know that you've got your coffee or you're, very, you're sitting away with your family. Maybe the kids are running crazy. But I just want to take a moment of your time, a small opportunity to remind you of the wonder of this day. 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. In those first couple of verses, he's saying, I know you believe this, Corinthians. This is the gospel I presented to you, and you're standing strong in it. But as we read, we're going to see that some people are beginning to question the fact that there is a resurrection from the dead. And some people had an initial flurry of excitement about the faith, but now they're beginning to fall away from it. And he's saying those people believed in vain because they're not enduring with it. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He's saying, what I have told you is not something that I made up. Everything that I've shared with you is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, which prophesied his coming, it prophesied his death on the cross, and it prophesied his resurrection. These primary elements I'm sharing with you are not something that I conjured up. They're fulfilling the prophecies laid down by the Jewish prophets. He says after it fulfilled the scriptures, and then in verse 5, 
um, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. It's as if, it's as if he is saying, if you have any doubt about the resurrection of Jesus, go talk to him. There's over 500 of them. Most of them are still alive. You can travel. You can find people who will claim to see the resurrected Savior. And it's not just one kook, one nut out in the field somewhere saying, I saw Jesus alive. There's over 500 people who will profess to this. So this is a historical thing that happened. This is something that actually occurred, and you can go talk to the witnesses. And the reason I, I focus on that is there are a lot of beliefs. There are thousands of different religions in the world. There are people who follow Jediism from Star Wars. There are people who follow mysticism, that the universe itself is God. There are people who think that they are God. There are people who, uh, in ancient worlds, look to the planets as deities. And so we have this plethora of belief systems. It's not a matter of having belief. You can believe in a lot of things, but do you have any time where you can go and say, and here's the facts surround it? Paul is saying to this, these, this church in Corinth, you can go talk to the people who saw him. This is a historical experience that actually happened. Our faith is not based on fancy. Our faith is based on a historical event. And then he says, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And then we skip up to verse 12. He says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? In that day, you had Jews who were coming into the Christian communities and trying to pull people out of the Christian faith and back to, back to Judaism's belief systems. And in the confines of Judaism, you had a group of people called Sadducees. And the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And then you also had other pagan belief systems that did not believe in the resurrection. So you had these, even, for, even from Jewish camps and other camps, you had people filtering into the Christian communities and trying to say, you don't actually believe you're going to come back to life, do you? You don't actually believe that someone who's been dead can come back to life. He laid there for three days. You think he really came back to life? Some people say the same things to us. There are plenty of people in our world right now, in America right now, who look at us and when we say, I know that, that my grandmother passed away and, and she's, she's in the ground, but one day she's going to come back to life and we're going to get to spend eternity in heaven together. They may not say it to us, but oftentimes they look at us as, as childish or foolish and think we believe in the fantasy of fantasies. They think that life is lived and then die, then you die, and that's it. And we say, no, there's more to it than that. We have hope. We have trust that one day we too will come back to life, that we will spend eternity with our Heavenly Father. We will spend eternity with Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth. And this is not the end. This is not all there is. And in that culture, in that day, you had this burgeoning faith in Jesus Christ and in the hope of a world to come. And then you had people saying, that's not going to happen. There is really no resurrection. So from a theological standpoint, from a belief standpoint, Paul begins to walk them through what happens if there is no such thing as the resurrection. He says and again in verse 12, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that He raised Christ, who He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. So he says basically like this. Here's the breakdown. If you're saying that there's no life beyond this. If you're saying that the resurrection isn't true, then 
all these things you've been preaching about trying to live a certain way and putting your faith in Jesus Christ and the world that is to come, that's, that's a waste of your time. Jesus had a lot of teachings. It wasn't simply about the resurrection. He taught us how to love the poor. He taught us how to have compassion for each other. He taught us the love that a man is supposed to have for his wife. He taught us the way that we're supposed to uh, fellowship with our, with our brothers and sisters. He taught us the way to bring about resolution from conflict. He taught us that um, our Father loves us and we can, have a, we can abide in Him and He can abide in us. The Gospels are filled with His teachings. And, and Paul is saying, but if there is no resurrection, if, if there's no hope of life after death, that all those teachings are garbage and you're wasting your time. You who gather together in churches on Sundays when there's not a pandemic, you're wasting that hour. You are wasting that time. You who give money to missionaries so that they can support this gospel effort around the world, you're wasting your money. Put it back in your pocket. Go buy an apple with it. You are, you are, you, you're wasting all your time and energy on something that has no consequence. Your faith is in vain. The faith you have, you believe in an afterlife, there's no resurrection. Why would you believe that? Also, if he says if there is no resurrection, if people can't come back from the dead, if that doesn't happen, Jesus Christ has not come back from the dead, and you're misrepresenting who God is because we testify that God raised Christ from the dead. If the dead don't raise, then who you say God is is also being misrepresented. Verse 16, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. If there is no resurrection... There is no forgiveness of sins. While our sin, the penalty for our sins were paid on the cross, but the authentication of that is the resurrection. It's like it's, it, it affirms, the resurrection of Jesus affirms the work of Christ on the cross. They go together. The, 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 the resurrection is the receipt, if you will, it is the proof of purchase. If Christ did not come back to life after the crucifixion, his claim to be God is nullified. His claim to be the Son of Man is extinguished. So without the resurrection, there is no joy in the forgiveness of sins. They go together. They go together to affirm that. Also it says in verse 18, Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Those people that have died before us, they're not spending eternity in heaven. They're perishing in the ground. They're rotting in their graves, and that's all there ever is if there is no resurrection. Verse 19, If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now, why would he say we're most to be pitied? It's because, particularly for his day, Christians were being abused because of their faith. Families were being torn apart. People were being thrown to the wild animals. People were dying at the sword. That's true for some parts of our world still today, but in America, we don't wake up with the fear that someone's going to come kill us because we're Christians. It's not that bad yet. They lived under fear of persecution. Paul's going to talk in a minute about how he almost expects each and every day to die. And oftentimes, while Christianity, there are some things that make being a Christian it easier to face this world. There are other times where it's not so easy to be a Christian. When you have to stand up to someone you love and say the lifestyle that you are choosing is wrong, that's not an easy place to be in. When your boss comes to you and says, listen, I need you to fudge these numbers. I need you to, I need you to, to shift a little bit on, on your story here so that we can get by this with this inspection or whatever, and you say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that, then that can create a lot of friction in the workplace. Whenever we can't affirm what people are wanting to do with the way our society is running because of our faith system, then it sometimes makes things uncomfortable. And so 
we are putting we are we are trying to uphold godly values because we believe in the resurrection and then if that none of that is true then everything we've been doing is pointless and we're to be most pitied so let's again look at what this means how our joy is found in this and the theology behind it if the resurrection isn't true then our preaching is in vain our faith is in vain our testimony of who God is, is is a lie. Our hope that we have in living this life for Him is pointless, and we're still lost in our sins, and we're just going to rot in our graves when we die. So that's the, that's the, the theological ramifications of the resurrection. But then let's look at the life application of it. That's the theology of it. That's the spirit. That's what happens to the truth of who God is if we get rid of the resurrection. But let's look at what it means for us in the way that we live our lives daily because of this faith and this truth that we hold on to. He says in verse 30, Why am I in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. And that's not talking about, sometimes we talk about dang, excuse me, about dying daily, but we talk about more in the confines of, of our sin. I'm going to lay aside my sin. I'm going to sacrifice my wants and try to have God's wants. And while that's absolutely true, and that's true of what we're supposed to do, that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, I wake up every day with a bullseye on my back. I wake up every day and I'm trying to advance this gospel message knowing that when I begin to preach this that perhaps the Jews are going to try and throw me out of town and stone me. Perhaps the local magistrates are going to arrest me and abuse me. I'm going to have to go through hardships. I may go through long times of, of solitude. I may go through long spans of hunger. I endure all of this. I live my life on the line for Christ. That's one of the applications of the resurrection. In America, honestly, we've got it easy. We're very comfortable. We're very at ease, a lot of us. We don't put our lives in the line for the sake of the gospel. We'll barely step out of our comfort zones. But Paul says part of living this life Part of what we're supposed to do is be willing to put it all out there, to risk it all for the gospel message. So we've got to be willing to live a life sacrificially for who Jesus Christ is, for the resurrection that He has promised to us, because He is the first fruit of that resurrection. So the first thing again is we've got to live completely for Him, risking what we have to declare the truth to those around us. He says as an example in verse 32, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with the beast of Ephesus? I, I, we don't know if he's speaking about literal beasts or just how angry the people were at Ephesus. He says, I've gone and I have fought with people. I have struggled. And what, what point is it to do all this if there's no resurrection? It doesn't matter if I have the belief system. If I'm going out and struggling with this, I'm living a hard life. I'm doing this because I believe in this. What are you doing because you truly, to the core of your bones, believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead? How is that impacting your day to day? Paul's willing to go into the rough places, into the hard places, to share the gospel message. Are we willing to do anything close to that? Are we willing to talk to our neighbors? Are we willing to follow through with the who's your one and talk to that person that God has laid on our heart? Are we willing to follow through with that? Because we so animately, or adamantly believe that there is a hope to come. Are we willing to move forwards? So first of all, sacrifice. Secondly, he says, um, if the... Let me just read verse 32 again. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with the beast at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. I want to read a quote, or not want to read it, I want to tell you a quote from Gwyneth Paltrow. 
She at one point said, and I can't tell you the full quote because of the expletive she uses, but she says, this is our one shot. Life is our one shot, and we need to milk it for all it's worth. In a negative argument, Paul is saying that's absolutely correct. If there is no resurrection, then you should eat and drink for tomorrow you die. You need to grab life by all the gusto you can and imbibe in all the different sensual pleasures you could possibly get yourself because this is it. This is your one last shot. This is your only shot for any joy, for any security, for any value, for any identity. This is your 15 minutes of fame. This is it. And then it's lights out for all eternity. And so Paul says, you know, if, if, this is, if, this, if there's no resurrection, then do that. If you don't believe in the resurrection and this is all there is, then you need to get out there and you need to grab life by the horns and you need to take charge and you need to get as much as you possibly can. But if the resurrection is true, then you can lay aside those wants. You can lay aside those indulgences because anything that you think you could sample on this world pales in comparison to the joy of eternity with God. No, no, no side dalliance, no side, no, no sneaking off uh, cheating on your spouse, no sense of indulging in, in um, trying to accumulate some mass of wealth is in any way going to measure or, or it will all pale in comparison to what is to come. No sin, no pleasure that you try to enjoy now is going to bring you any lasting eternal joy. It only comes because of the resurrection. It only comes in those greater things that God has in store for us. So we don't have to get caught up in the commercialism, in the materialism, in the, in the relationship, the sexual relationships, the party lifestyle, because that's all empty. What is real is eternity. What is real is the resurrected life. So it should shift. The resurrection should shift our values away from the momentary pleasure to the eternal joy the eternal hope that we have. So again, first, we need to be willing to live life to the fullest for Christ. Then we need to be willing to lay aside the momentary pleasures so that we can focus on the eternal pleasures. And finally, it says, or, or really two other things. Verse 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. In the gospel of of Matthew, Jesus says that we need to be storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not treasures on earth, where moths come in and eat and rust comes in and destroys, where the thief comes in and steals. We need to be laying up treasures in heaven. The way we live life now, what we do for God now, has an eternal consequence. And if we're listening to the negative influences in our lives, or we're trying to follow what our our Hollywood stars say, or sometimes even what our politicians say. We're not following what God says. And so we need to surround ourselves with people who are going to speak truth to us, people who are going to speak God's Word to us. We should have a hunger for God's Word and, and to understand it, rather than all the different wisdom of the age. And so if we're living our life to the fullest for Christ and we're setting aside the momentary pleasures and we're surrounding ourselves with people who are speaking the truth to us and hold us accountable to what God's Word says, then that is how we live because of the resurrection. That is how we're to operate. This day, this Easter day, has, has daily expectations upon it. The joy that we have, we celebrate and we sing and we praise Him, but do we live differently because of it? We need to be living a life of, of surrendering the world's pleasures and wants and surrender our lives to Him. And then 
because of that, and as we surround ourselves again with people who are going to speak God's truth to us, we also need to go out and seek the people who don't yet know it. We need to be seeking the people who are on our Hoosier One list. We need to be thinking about the pocket of lostness that we're in. I want to ask you right now, do you know what pocket of lostness we're located in? We've shared it a couple of times. If you know what pocket of lostness this church is resting in, type that into the chat window. And I want to see just who, who remembers what it is. And we need to be focusing on those individuals. I want to look, read in verse 34. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right, and do, no, do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. He says, listen, wake up from your drunken stupor. You have put your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ. You believe that he rose from the dead. You believe that one day you too are going to raise from the dead, and yet your life is marked not by joyous victory. It is marked by lazy sinfulness. And you are not being an example to the people around you. You are not sharing this truth, this joy, this wondrous resurrection with them. They don't know about any of this. And I say this to your shame. To my shame. We have gotten our priorities so out of whack that our world is dying. And, and, and Paul describes it in this passage as almost a drunken stupor. We become so callous to it that it doesn't even affect us anymore. It doesn't jar us. It doesn't move us. It doesn't awaken us. He says, wake up. You need to take sin seriously. You need to repent of it. And you need to be on task in sharing this truth with the world. Because of the joy it brings you. Don't you want others to have that joy? Because of the security it brings you. Don't you want others to have that security? Because of the hope that you have. Don't you want others to have that hope? It is to your shame that we don't live that way. It is to my shame that we don't live that way. But praise God, we don't have to stay that way. Today, today, we can let the impact of the joy of the resurrection, the theological truth behind it, and apply that to our lives and start out tomorrow in some way, shape, or form sharing this truth, contacting somebody, telling somebody. And when we're finally able to get out and about, we can go out and about and we can put ourselves in uncomfortable situations to share the truth of this resurrection, find joy in that. We can lay aside our gluttonous wants, our, our sensuous desires, and adopt a, a, a craving for what is eternal. And then we can go and share that with the world. And that's what we need to do. So I'd like to pray for us now. I'd like to pray for you this Easter Sunday, whether you're with your family or whether you're by yourself, that we can have that joy and then we can act upon those truths. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you now. <clears throat> I pray that we can understand just how important this day is. And that we do celebrate. In just a few moments, we're going to be singing songs together. May we lift high our voices to you and praise you. But then let us remember just how important for our entire faith your resurrection is. And then live lives worthy of that resurrection. Let us not sink back down into a drunken sleepiness. Let us be on fire for you. Let the joy of this day propel us into an active life for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.